So welcome to Chautauqua County and the Jamestown area, Stan, because everybody's been very excited about your parents. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Phil Zimmer absolutely has a man crush on you. You didn't know that. <laughs> well, I've been, uh, I've been writing books since 1963, or at least publishing since 1963. My first book was about Lawrence of Arabia. The result is that I've dealt with war, or the aftermath of war, uh, for many, many decades now. <clears throat> And the newest one is about my war, the Korean War. Yeah. Well, in the aftermath of war, what you have here at the Robert Jackson Center <laughs> is a, uh, an entity designed to advance the legacy of the guy who was the chief prosecutor of the Nuremberg trial, which really was the bookend of World War II. The Nuremberg trials were just the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, they continued for a long time. Um, I'm amazed at the extent of detail that was gone into by the prosecutors to uh, make it uh, absolutely certain that people realized and understood that these were not just ordinary villains, uh, but that these were perpetrators of the most terrible war ever fought. In your research on Franklin Roosevelt and many other related World War II matters, did the name Jackson come up much at all? The name Jackson probably doesn't appear in any of my books, as far as I can remember. Uh, but I've written 60 books, <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty hard to tell. Uh, I did write a book about the end of World War II, uh, which ended with the surrender of Japan. Uh, the result is that uh, the period of April and May 1945 is not covered as thoroughly uh, as the uh, end of the war with Japan. Uh, so I, I never dealt with the Nuremberg trials themselves. Uh, one of my publishers uh, wanted me to deal somehow with Nuremberg. Uh, Truman Talley was my editor, uh, and he sent me a book he had published uh, under his imprint about the Nuremberg trials. Uh, but it never turned out to be useful for me uh, because uh, no book I wrote about dealt with the aftermath of, uh, of World War II. Did, you, did your paths cross with uh, Joe Persico at all? No, no, no. I know his work. It didn't cross with me. Uh, much of the work I've done uh, was done with documents rather than with people. Uh, but. Uh, I dealt with a lot of living uh, survivors of war, including World War I. When I began work on the armistice in 1918, there were still elderly people available uh, who had fought in that war. And uh, because I had done some work on Bernard Shaw, uh, the producer of a, a revival of My Fair Lady uh, said, you should meet my father. Uh, his father was Ewart Garland, mm -hmm. who was a uh, Royal uh, Flying Corps survivor. He had uh, actually been in the air at the time of the armistice uh, in a new de Havilland uh, fighter plane in November 11, 1918. And uh, we had a talk with, uh, with Garland. Uh, and uh, I said, I know you have a diary uh, that you kept, that's in the Imperial War Museum, we're going to look at it. He said, oh, don't bother looking at it, I'll give you a copy. Wow. So we came home with a copy of your Garland's diary. So I knew uh, some survivors of World War I, and when World War II came along, uh, I was 10 years old in 1939 when the war began with Poland, uh, and uh, not much older when Pearl Harbor came along and I began writing about the war. I wrote about the war at the start in 1939 at age 10 uh, in a copy book, a lined copy book. I thought I was writing a history of the war when I was just recopying the headlines from the newspapers. Uh, but you get started writing one way or another. And even before that, uh, I was fascinated by war because I collected bubblegum cards. 
there were war cards in the 1930s uh, dealing with the war in Spain, the war in China, uh, the war between Japan and, and uh, China, I'm sorry, and the war in Ethiopia. And th these were bubblegum cards for a penny each. Um, I threw away the bubblegum, kept the cards, uh, and that taught me my first uh, history of the war. These were like posters, uh, that is the portraits and pictures they drew. Um, most of them were propaganda, they were not true. Uh, for example, uh, Colin Kelly, uh, who was one of our first heroes after Pearl Harbor, uh, never uh, bombed the battleship Haruna. Uh, he died uh, in uh, a crash of his plane. Uh, and in 1945, the Navy found the Haruna in Kure Harbor in Japan, no which gives you an idea how accurate the bubblegum cards were. Uh, but they continued on in World War II when we were involved. Number one in the new set was General MacArthur, the, the hero, they said, of Bataan. Uh, he was not the hero of Bataan. He spent two hours on Bataan once, and uh, yet he was known as the hero of Bataan. Uh, so he rankled in my memory for many years uh, because of that in uh, my latest book, uh, does not make a hero of him either. Were you interested in the actual tactics of the war or the personalities? You know, like when you think early on, whether it's Franco, Tito, Goering, these guys' pictures all over, was that, did that grab you or the fact that there was some activity on the ground? Uh, I got first involved with biography, with people, uh, because events are steered by people. Mm -hmm. uh, the events occur whether the people were involved with them or not to start. Uh, but people make war and people continue the war and people end war. Uh, and one thing I learned very quickly uh, was that peace is harder to make than war. Uh, war is stimulating to people for some reason. And I found working on uh, Bernard Shaw's play Heartbreak House, which ends with a Zeppelin raid, a Zeppelin bombing a country village, uh, that the lady of the house, after the Zeppelin passes by, having dropped bombs and killed two people, is exhilarated and says, I wish they'd come again. And that attitude helps make wars prolonged. Mm -hmm. I wish they'd come again. Uh, People who are not involved in the war personally don't realize how terrible it is. <clears throat> One thing that lives with you when you are involved in a war is the smell of decay of corpses. And that, that's hard to explain mm -hmm. uh, because people are not uh, confronted with this very often unless you come upon the decaying carcass of an admiral, of an admiral, animal, <laughs> I got lost there, of, a, of an animal uh, that has a decayed smell to it. When I landed in Korea, uh, there were two smells that uh, just uh, obliterated everything else. One was the smell of the decay of the dead, and the other was the fact that, uh, that the farmers used a fecal fertilizer, a human fertilizer. And there were what were called honey carts all over the place carrying the fecal fertilizer. So th those two aromas were war to me. Yeah. Not the idea of I wish they'd come again and excite me, but uh, the devastation and the, the stink of war. And it's, it's very hard to write a book about war uh, to convey that because people want excitement. They want heroism. Uh, they, they want uh, all kinds of uh, endeavor that, that excites them. So it's a challenge to write about the reality of war. You, I think I read someplace or maybe heard someplace that during the Korean War, which you were uh, certainly an intimate part, that uh, you were, uh, had to kind of quell a prisoner of war. You talked a little bit about that uh, the other night. Uh, uh, issue. What was that backdrop? Well, I, I was involved with the Prisoner of War Command 
and the Eighth Army. <coughs> Excuse me. The prisoners mutinied. We had well over a hundred thousand prisoners, uh, and uh, they were basically in two camps, on the mainland and on the island of Koji. Uh, I had nothing to do with the island of Koji, <coughs> where there were something like eighty thousand prisoners. They rioted. The 187th Airborne Regiment had to be called in uh, to put down the riots. People died. Uh, the prisoners used makeshift weapons like uh, Molotov cocktails and lances that they made out of uh, the ends of, uh, uh, of uh, stretchers. Uh, they did the same thing on the mainland in a smaller capacity. And I wrote a book called War in the Wards about the mutiny in the prisoner of war hospital. It was the biggest hospital in the world. It had over 10,000 uh, POW patients and more than that number of POW laborers uh, who serviced the, uh, pr the prisoner patients. Uh, even the amputees went to war. Uh, the, the horror of war, uh, I guess, can't be explained in that respect because no pictures were taken, no pictures were allowed, mm -hmm. no correspondence were there. But one compound of 3,000 amputees, 3,000 amputees marched uh, in mutiny with makeshift weapons, um, marched on, on pegs, marched on stumps. Uh, it's an incredible uh, bit of fanaticism uh, that sustained them. Uh, and they had to be shot down. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one, I remember one prisoner who was one-legged uh, marching and being hit uh, by a concussion grenade that landed at his feet, his foot, rather, he had only one. Uh, when the grenade exploded, he had no feet. Uh, but this is the kind of, uh, of horror you find in war. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't believe uh, war is a solution to anything, mm -hmm. uh, because war just leads to another war. Uh, we found that happening with World War I, uh, the solution uh, of the Treaty of Versailles uh, was a blunder. It ended in another war, World War II. Uh, in Korea, five years after World War II ended, uh, we were fighting another war and we were using the weapons that had first been discarded in, in the, the end of World War II. In fact, the Army had to buy back surplus radios and such for use in the, uh, in the Korean War because they had been discarded. And here we had, a, we're always unprepared for war. Speaking about unprepared, you were probably, uh, again, a story you talked about. You actually had to write up your own request for a medal. Well, I... How'd that work? Um, I had to do that because I was involved in a, uh, a secret intelligence operation uh, that was uh, contrary to the Geneva Convention, contrary to all uh, military uses, uh, or usages, I should say. Uh, but war isn't fought by gentlemen. Uh, the gentlemen who are the uh, senior generals may sit back uh, in posh circumstances and direct you. Uh, but the real war is carried on otherwise. Uh, our job, uh, secretly, uh, was to turn prisoners. That is, we tried to find sympathetic prisoners on the front lines who claimed, uh, when they were taken prisoner, uh, that they were forced into the service, they were really any communist, uh, they had nothing to do with the government that forced them to invade South Korea, et cetera. And so the ones that seemed most believable, uh, we trained in the South uh, to go back and become spies. Uh, they went back by submarine and dinghy, or they went back by parachute. Uh, and almost nothing of this has ever been described in, in history books. And my own colonel didn't know that I was involved in this because uh, this was a compartmentalized operation 
that you only knew what you were supposed to know mm -hmm. and nothing more. The result was that when I was about to leave uh, Korea after 17 months there, uh, he called me in and said, I have a TWX, uh, that is a teletype message, ordering, you, ordering me, he meant himself, ordering me uh, to write you up for a medal, a Bronze Star Medal. But I don't know what for. <laughs> he said, you're a professor, write me something. And I wasn't a professor, all I had taught uh, as a graduate student. Uh, and he gave me a pad and pencil, and uh, I had to write something innocuous that didn't indicate anything that I was really doing. And I thought it was very silly, uh, but I wrote something about ground action against the enemy uh, with no details, whatever, uh, and uh, gave it back to him. And he said, uh, fine, that will do. And uh, I got up and saluted and uh, left. And on a troop ship, uh, I went home. And that was it. Uh, about six months later, I got a letter telling me that I had been awarded a medal. Uh, would I like to come to Fort Meade, Maryland uh, and uh, receive the medal in a ceremony? Uh, or would I just like it mailed? Mm -hmm. I said, mail it. And there was no ceremony. I didn't want to go back to Fort Meade, Maryland for anything at all. And the next day or day after, uh, I got another letter from the uh, Department of Defense saying I had been approved for top secret uh, clearance. That is, the work I had been doing in the Army was finally approved <laughs> <laughs> when I was a civilian. Describe a little bit now uh, this secret mission, and, and, and also maybe going back as these prisoners of war, North Korean prisoners of war, what were you looking for? What was that um, skill set that you thought oh. would convince you? Uh, this was called Operation Turncoat. Uh, turncoat meant, quite literally, uh, uh, turning prisoners into your side. Uh, when they were offered the opportunity, if you can call it that, uh, to go back and spy for us, uh, they were told that if they got back safely, if they were Chinese and they got back safely, we would send them to Taiwan and uh, they would be safe in Taiwan. If they were South, Co if they were North Korean <coughs> or South Korean and pressed into the North Korean army, uh, we would take care of them in South Korea somehow and give them some kind of bonus. Uh, I don't have the details to that because that was not part of my job. Uh, th that is the, the inducement part afterwards. Uh, nor was the information that they were supposed to pick up uh, part of my job. My job was to recruit them and uh, uh, make, make sure that they were our, our kind of people. Uh, it didn't work that way. Uh, some of them, I think probably most of them, uh, took advantage of our being so naive at war by using this as a ticket to go home. Mm -hmm. That was very easy. We were taking them back home and training them to go back home. Uh, some of them must have done their job uh, because we listened to Mo Moscow radio. Uh, very often, Moscow radio told us how many of our planes were shot down that we didn't know about because our side never revealed the, uh, the facts. But we also learned uh, that the uh, other side uh, captured some spies uh, and had executed them summarily. And there were no details were given except on occasion they said uh, uh, that uh, spies had shot some of their officers and then were caught and were executed on the spot. And we figured they were our, our people, but we never knew. Uh, this is what happens in, compart in compartmentalized uh, uh, circumstances where you're only given a little bit of information for your own use and uh, for the use of the uh, intelligence people, and you're not told anything else. Uh, I would have um, an officer, he claimed to be an officer, uh, he claimed to be a major, he gave me a name, I'm not sure the name meant anything, and it was not that it was real. Uh, he said, we have some potential spies 
uh, that are prisoners of war in the prisoner of war hospital. Uh, we want to get them loose so we can train them to, to go spy in China and North Korea. We want you to get them loose. So that was another part of the job. Uh, I killed prisoners on paper. That is, uh, they were considered dead and they were spirited out to be spies. Uh, some of them uh, were escapers. That is, I announced that they had escaped uh, and couldn't be found and they were trained as spies. Uh, some of them were taken out on stretchers for major surgery. Uh, and yes, we took them out on stretchers, but they disappeared. Um, they disappeared because they were part of Operation Turncoat. Uh, you don't find this in the history books. A lot of history just doesn't turn up. So you have it there. Uh, this is fascinating. <laughs> uh, so there's really no way to gauge the efficacy of the program itself, is there? Uh, I would gauge it as a total failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, as I said, it's compartmentalized. I have no way of knowing the parts that were not involved uh, in my doing. Uh, but it seems to me that many of them took this as a uh, cheap way to get a ticket home. And that they pretended to be on our side, but they they, they went home. Uh, I don't know of any actual information uh, that they contributed because that was not part of my deal. Uh, I do know that uh, in a, the 1990s, I think it was, uh, one officer, former officer, returned as a tourist to North Korea. And uh, he wanted to find people that he had assigned as part of his duty, similar duty. Uh, and he was taken prisoner and uh, jailed, uh, and eventually he was permitted uh, to go home. Uh, but that was the only information I know of that actually appeared in print. Wow. Uh, segwaying back a little bit, you were born 1929 in Philadelphia, and the most critical question that I wanted to ask, and I've been thinking about this, is were you a Philadelphia A's fan or a Philadelphia Phillies fan? Uh, I attended as a kid uh, the last games played in Baker Bowl, uh, which was the Phillies uh, domain. Uh, Baker Bowl was so small, at Broad and Lehigh Avenue, uh, was so small that uh, Chuck Klein, the first baseman, uh, would hit a ball uh, just, a, I'd say, a, a foot below home run level uh, and get a single if he was lucky. <laughs> because the field was that small. Yeah. Uh, I did see uh, athletic games also, and I collected baseball cards. Uh, I saw Bob Feller in one of his first games uh, that he pitched. Uh, uh, I saw some of the great Yankees games when they paralyzed the athletics. Uh, I remember one game that the Yankees won that I attended with one of my uncles. Uh, the Yankees won 23 to 2. <laughs> yeah. We were almost the only ones left in the stands at the end of the game because everybody else figured there was no point in staying. But after all, a kid wants to see the whole thing. And um, my cousin and I stayed for the, the whole game. 23 to 2. Well, the, athletic, the, thing of the athletics, I think of just Connie Mack in a, in a suit. I mean, not a uniform, but a suit. Uh, he was almost invisible. He, he sat in the dugout, uh, never came out to talk to umpires. Uh, the, uh, the reputation of Connie Mack was about zero. Uh, he sold off the best players on his team, uh, sold them mainly to the Yankees. Uh, and he had almost nobody left. If anybody turned out to be good, uh, he was a rarity. Uh, I guess uh, my favorite was uh, a pitcher named Chubby Dean. Yep. And th there was an outfielder, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, his last name was Johnson. I can't remember his first name. Do you remember? Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson. Yep. Uh, he was uh, partly American Indian. And uh, when he came to bat, the uh, would issue uh, 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 Indian calls 
Uh, and you couldn't do that now. <laughs> yeah, you know the story of the Redskins and their problems. Dan Snyder, yeah, yeah he's yeah. got a lot of those things. Yeah. Uh, December 7th, 1941, you're 12 years old. Um, do you remember that day? Oh, yes. I was listening on the radio to uh, the, the uh, Eagles playing the Redskins. And uh, in the middle of the game, uh, there was suddenly an announcement that we could hear a public address announcement uh, that uh, all, all military officers in the stands report immediately for duty. And we had no idea why. Uh, but uh, we found out very soon because they broke into the program with a, an announcement of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, we had no idea how bad it was because that was, of course, uh, hidden for a long time. Uh, I d wasn't listening to it, but I recall I wrote about this, in fact, uh, in a book called uh, Long Day's Journey into War, about every hour that it was December the 7th somewhere around the world. I, I wrote that it, the Sunday matinee broadcast of the New York Philharmonic was going on at the same time, and uh, at intermission, uh, Arthur Rudzinski, the conductor, uh, learned of the attack on Pearl Harbor, and he wanted to announce it, uh, but he wondered how to announce it without panic. Uh, he, the soloist was Arthur Rubinstein, the great pianist. He said to Rubinstein, as they came on, Rubinstein was to play a concerto, he said, I want you to begin by playing the national anthem. Uh, Rubinstein said, I've never played the national anthem before. And uh, Rodzinski said, I'm sure you, you can do it by ear. And so he sat down, he began to play the national anthem, and Rodzinski told the audience to stand, and they, therefore they were standing quietly and uh, at, uh, in, in a discipline that happens when you stand for the national anthem. Uh, when it was over, he announced that uh, we were at war. It was a clever way to, wow. to do it, to avoid panic. That's amazing. That's just so visual. And yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the next day is when President Roosevelt goes to Congress at age 12. Again, did that mean anything? When oh, yes, because after all, I had been a war card collector, and I had started writing a book about the beginning of the war that turned out not to be very useful, and I'd gotten rid of it. Uh, I listened to that broadcast. Uh, and uh, later, of course, I wrote about it in Long Day's Journey into War. Uh, uh, I have hanging on the wall in my study a copy of the manuscript of that speech. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very important to me uh, because people confuse a major word in the speech. Uh, Roosevelt started out by saying that it would be a day that will live in infamy. And he crossed it out by hand. The secretary had typed it. He crossed it out by hand and wrote it instead of day, date, date, December 7th. A date will live in infamy. Mm -hmm. And there were other small changes like that. And uh, I felt they were important uh, changes that uh, made a very brief speech very dramatic. Did, did you, even at that young age, consider the World War II is just really being an extension of World War I, where there was just sort of a pause, but there's a direct continuation from the Treaty of Versailles to World War II? I think I was too young to know it then. Uh, but it became very clear when I was collecting uh, bubblegum cards about the war in Ethiopia and the war in Spain, particularly the war in Spain, uh, that this was a prelude to a bigger war, mm -hmm. that we were going to eventually uh, end up in a war, and this was just the overture to the symphony. And uh, we were going to have more war. Uh, but after all, we had a huge uh, uh, population of non-interventionists, uh, people who didn't want another war. Yet we didn't have much experience of war. We went to war in 1917, uh, but in effect, the troops didn't get into a shooting contest until the summer of 1918. So the Americans were only at war uh, for about five months at most. 
uh, we didn't experience the devastation. Nobody ever attacked our shores. Mm -hmm. uh, it was difficult for us to understand that this war could reach us somehow, uh, but it did. Uh, we knew it was coming. Uh, I knew from reading the newspapers that the Japanese were having uh, diplomatic uh, negotiations with us in Washington, and they didn't seem to be going anywhere, and yet the war was likely to happen. Uh, most people thought it would happen in Europe, but of course it happened uh, in the Pacific first. And when Churchill found out about it, uh, on the evening of December the 7th, uh, he announced to his dinner guests, we're saved, we're saved, we, we, we're going to win the war. Because he knew that the preponderant uh, industrial forces of the United States uh, were on his side and uh, we would win. Uh, very, very few people know uh, that we were actually attacked by the Japanese uh, during World War II. Uh, they knew that the, the uh, Nazis had landed some spies uh, on the coast of New Jersey and Long Island. They were captured quickly. They were sentenced to death quickly, and that was all over. Uh, but in the Pacific, Japanese submarines surfaced and fired on refineries in the, uh, on the California coast. Uh, people didn't know it. It wasn't, it wasn't announced. Uh, you kept that quiet. And uh, later on, a Japanese seaplane, uh, which was on the deck of a submarine, uh, actually bombed uh, Oregon. Uh, but it was so minor an episode that, again, nobody cared much about it. The most interesting example uh, was one where the Japanese sent balloon bombs to the United States. Uh, and again, people didn't know about it because it was kept quiet. Uh, the, the trade winds from Japan actually travel over the United States, over the Pacific to the uh, Northwest USA. Uh, toward the end of the war, uh, the Japanese desperately were looking for some way to panic the population of uh, the United States. They had schoolgirls. Uh, school was out in Japan for those last months of the war. They had schoolgirls patch together uh, fabric uh, to make balloons, huge balloons, to which were attached incendiary bombs and then flown across the Pacific. Uh, on one occasion, an incendiary bomb uh, attached to a balloon uh, landed in a uh, forest in Oregon uh, the balloon uh, deflated. The bomb was still there. Uh, a minister and his wife and, and his children in Oregon were out on a picnic. Uh, they, the children spotted the balloon, uh, deflated balloon. The minister worried about what it was, says, don't go near it, don't go near it. But they did, the, the bomb exploded. And the only people killed on American soil by enemy action were the minister and his family because of the balloon bomb. But other balloons landed uh, as far east as Michigan. They, thousands of them were sent up uh, to, on the trade winds. And the most interesting one of all, I didn't discover until after I'd written my book about the end of the war. One balloon bomb landed in Hanford, Washington, where the atomic bomb was being built. Landed in Hanford, Washington. Uh, it landed on a building where plutonium was being extracted. Somehow it, was, it didn't go off. And we had enough plutonium to bomb Nagasaki and end the war. As you written so much about the war uh, and it, the personalities behind the war. As you sit here today in 2014, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? I think there'll never be an end to war. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping 
all the wars will be small wars that can be contained. Uh, but I don't see how you can win a war today because even if you win it, you lose it. Uh, how can you win a war with an atomic bomb that, that is going to uh, pollute the atmosphere? Uh, and how can you win a war against fanatics uh, who will not end the war because it's not going their way? Uh, I don't think we can end a war in Afghanistan uh, or Iraq. Uh, I think eventually we'll have to leave because the people on the ground aren't even interested in having us there. We're trying to save them. They don't want us. They don't want us. Uh, and this may occur elsewhere. Uh, I think there are always going to be uh, fanatical uh, rebellions uh, in Africa. We, there are all kinds of uh, fanatical groups in Africa, like the Boko Haram. Uh, we can't win against them. Uh, there is no way that our troops on the ground can defeat uh, small groups of fanatics like this. And we, I'm not saying we have to become isolationists, but I think we have to limit our involvement to where we'll do some real good. Uh, some lasting good. And uh, I don't see where that will happen right now. In the continuum of things that you've written about, again, you got World War One, you have some got World War Two, Korean War. Is the Cold War, that which occurred really in nineteen forty six and thereafter till nineteen ninety one, is that just a continuation of World War Two? I think it is. I think it is. In fact I think uh, people don't realize, including respected historians, uh, that the Cold War didn't begin uh, at the end of World War II. Uh, the Cold War was in process at the time of our helping the Russians by Lend-Lease. We were sending planes and uh, trucks and uh, tanks and other equipment uh, to the Russians. The Russians would not let our pilots uh, fly planes into Russia, for example. Uh, they would not let us uh, have truck drivers drive trucks into Russia from Iran, Persia. Uh, we had to land our planes, we had to ship our trucks uh, to a spot uh, near Russia, but not in Russia, if we could. And then the Russians would take over and send them in, or take them in. They did not want our people to see how bad things were in Russia. Uh, they did not want Russians to get any contact with ordinary Americans to find out what uh, life was really like uh, outside of their utopia. Uh, this went on through the whole war. It was very difficult uh, for Americans to have any real contact with, uh, with Russians because, as I said, they, they wanted to protect their skewed utopia. Uh, even toward the end of the war, 1945, uh, the Germans had captured literally millions of Russians. Uh, many of the Russians uh, surrendered easily. They didn't want to fight for Stalin. Uh, some of them were recruited uh, in a sort of Operation Turncoat uh, into a Russian-led army. General Vlasov's army uh, to fight against Stalin. Uh, others were by the hundreds of thousands in prison camps. We were ordered, uh, we meaning the Americans, were ordered by the Russians uh, to send all these people back to Russia because after all the Geneva Convention on Treatment of Prisoners of War uh, requires that you return prisoners to their homelands. The prisoners didn't want to go back. Uh, they didn't want to go back. They felt if they went back, the same thing that would happen would happen to them that happened to other prisoners after the Spanish Civil War. I had written a book about the Spanish Civil War called The Last Great Cause. Uh, in the Spanish Civil War, Russians who fought for the Loyalist side uh, went back to Russia thinking that, uh, after all, they were patriotic Russians who helped uh, fight against uh, Hitler and Mussolini. Uh, they were shot on the docks of Odessa when their ships arrived. The 
government did not want people back in Russia who knew what it was like on the other side because that was devastating to their uh, uh, propagandized way of life. The, the Russians who were prisoners of the Germans knew the same thing would happen to them. And in many cases, the trains that were taking them back to Russia included uh, men who committed suicide on the train rather than go back to Russia. They broke windows of the trains so that they could have glass shards in order to um, commit suicide with. And Harry Truman knew this. He was then president. Uh, he knew of this horror. Uh, the prisoners were not to go back because even being a prisoner of the Germans uh, would have looked utopian uh, to people who were starving in Russia. He used that lesson uh, in Korea. Uh, in Korea, we were told not to send back any prisoners uh, who did not want to go home, who did not want to return to Utopia. And as a result, we had uh, riots and mutinies in the prison camps between the pro-communist and the anti-communist sides that caused many deaths. We had to, uh, as I said, go in and uh, end the mutinies often with um, uh, with, with bullets and grenades. Uh, it wasn't clear to ordinary people <coughs> excuse me, why, why we were preventing these troops from going home. Uh, the communist side would not agree to a truce unless we rec repatriated all of their men. They didn't want to go back. They would have committed suicide, too, if they had gone back. In fact, many of them were not even from North Korea or China. They had been forced into service uh, when the North Koreans invaded the South. Uh, my interpreter in South Korea, in, uh, in many occasions, uh, a man named Chang, said that he was a farmer. Uh, in the north part of South Korea. He was taken prisoner and immediately given uh, a sack of rations, uh, like a sock, mm -hmm. a sack of barley, and told, this is, this is all you need. Uh, you now go out and fight the, uh, the South Koreans. He said, what about a gun? And they said, oh, the people behind you will have a gun. His job was to absorb the bullets. And there were many tens of thousands who were uh, taken prisoner by us because they surrendered willingly uh, in the fact that they had been forced into service by the communists. He, he said to them also, uh, what do I do when I run out of uh, my rations? Well, you forage. You forage. You find, you find your own. Uh, many of the troops that the communists sent down were badly uniformed. Uh, they had summer uniforms, it was winter. They had sneakers, they had no boots. They were told, you take the boots off a dead American. Uh, this, this is war. Mm -hmm. uh, it's unpleasant. And it's very hard to stop wars like this, which is why I said that uh, peace is harder to make than war. You're one of the most respected uh, historians uh, with over 50 books. Uh, who do you respect as a, uh, an acclaimed historian? Who's, is there a, somebody you like to read or somebody you've respected over time that saying, that guy is really good? Uh, I'd rather not name names. Okay. Uh, some of them uh, are very good indeed. Uh, some of them merely exploit sensation, and uh, uh, one or the other uh, sells books that way. Yeah. Uh, I'd rather do my own and uh, do my own research and not try to uh, take lines and uh, uh, and uh, lines out of other people's books and exploit what they've written. I mentioned one case. I'm not sure where it was, uh, because I gave two talks here about one of the respected uh, historians 
uh, of the Korean War, uh, claiming that he had been in Key West, Florida at a library and found 88 books about Vietnam and only four about the Korean War, that surely the Korean War is the forgotten war. And my comment about that would, was that very likely the books on the Korean War were taken out of, by readers <laughs> and the Vietnam War uh, was being ignored now. Uh, but there's no way to know. Uh, just how do you do it? Uh, I, I just give you a little vignette. When, when Joe Persico was here, and we, he did a book on Nuremberg, and so that's mm. why we were interested. But he also has done a number of books, and I asked the same question. At what point in, you, in your research do you say, enough is enough? Uh, there are several times, several ways you say enough is enough. One of them is you have a contract with a deadline date. <laughs> uh, and you turn a book in in time for the deadline because if you don't, uh, the contract can be voided. Mm -hmm. And if it's voided, then you've done all this work for nothing. Uh, or you have to find another publisher. So that's one way. Uh, the other is to plan ahead enough uh, that you can write the ending before you finish the middle of the book. That you know how it is going to conclude because you've done all your homework on this book. Uh, I thought that was going to be true uh, with the current book, the, uh, the book I've done on November, December 1950 in, in Korea. Uh, I had finished the book. Uh, 93 ships uh, took uh, our soldiers and tens of thousands of refugees uh, south from Hunnam Harbor, North Korea, uh, and that would be the end of the book. Uh, but no, uh, I discovered from the curator of the MacArthur Memorial and Museum in Virginia that he had interviewed a uh, retired lieutenant general who was 93 years old then, uh, who had been a lieutenant colonel, Korea. Uh, he was an engineering lieutenant colonel in the Army. He and a couple of soldiers uh, were left behind on the beach at Hongnam to make sure everything would be blown up. Uh, nothing left for the, uh, for, for the other side. Uh, then they were to escape. They were to escape on a, a dinghy that would take them to a ship waiting in the harbor. Well, there was an explosion uh, in the harbor and apparently one of our ships, it was never reported, one of our ships was, was uh, sunk by a mine. Uh, General Almond, who was the ass who was commander of our troops over there, uh, the commander uh, designated by MacArthur, thought that that meant that Lieutenant Colonel Rowney and his two men had died, uh, being blown up on their way back to safety. It had nothing to do with them, but the ships went off and abandoned them uh, on the beach. Uh, this was in the interview that was done in, in just a couple of years ago uh, by the curator of the MacArthur Museum. Uh, what did they do? Uh, the lieutenant colonel really was in a quandary, but one of his men who may have been smarter uh, said, <clears throat> let's take these sacks of dried milk that we aren't blowing up because they're not of much use to the Koreans. Let's take these sacks of dried milk and move them into the shape of an SOS. And maybe a plane will spot us or spot the SOS. And a plane did and took them off. Wow. And so I had a new ending to the book, <laughs> <laughs> which I hadn't expected. So Phil Zimmer is here. It's the first time you've met Phil Zimmer. Yes. Yes, we've had a long, friendly correspondence. So what do you think of him now that you've met him? Uh, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah. Um, he's t t taken care of us very well. Uh, he, he's obviously a, a very efficient guy. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, is there a book of yours that you have on your nightstand where you, when you're at night, you kind of just yeah. pick up one of your many books? Yeah. Uh, we have a house that's basically three levels. 
Uh, the top level are four bedrooms that nobody uses. Uh, the next level uh, has our master bedroom uh, and kitchen, dining room, living room, and so on. On that level, you will not find a book. No books. Uh, then you go down to the bottom level, and there are two studies, mine and Rodell's. There are a lot of books down there. Uh, I don't keep a book permanently uh, on a night table or a nightstand. Do you, do, do, do you revisit your books at all? I mean, you've written them, or and when, you, when you publish them, and they're now in hardbound, and you say, are you, are you done with them? Uh, I've often pirated my own books for other books. Mm -hmm. That is, I've used material uh, from other books b because they become useful uh, for new books. Uh, not that I'm repeating myself, but I'm using material I've already uh, quarried uh, for other books. Uh, do I read the books otherwise? Uh, yes, if I'm preparing to give a talk on a book. And it could be on any book. Sometimes I get letters from readers, including readers who read books that I wrote back in the 1960s, asking about where certain things came from, would I explain something, and I have to go back to a book. Uh, but my favorite example is once I was going to New York uh, to talk about a book. I went by train, which was very unusual for me from Penn State, where I was then. Uh, and the only book I had with me was my token book that I was going to be talking about. And so I opened it uh, and read a few pages and discovered a typographical error. <laughs> I was horrified. <laughs> and I, I hesitate to read books of my own uh, to praise myself inwardly uh, for fear I'll find another type of error. <clears throat> the error was a zero. And it became, uh, I, th I think, very important to me to make sure that numbers are checked. Uh, the end, at the end of World War II, we were shipping the atomic bomb to Tinian Island by the cruiser Indianapolis. The uh, Indianapolis delivered the bomb, then went off to the Philippines. Uh, it was sunk on the way to the Philippines. Fortunately, it wasn't sunk by a sub on the way to Tinian, or we wouldn't have had a bomb there. Yeah. However, uh, it was sunk by a Japanese sub with a 30-foot torpedo. It became a 300-foot torpedo by the extra zero, the typo. And I got two letters from people who read the book uh, saying, Sir, uh, you are obviously not in the Navy. Yeah. Or you would know that there are no torpedoes 300 feet long. Uh, I then went around signing books with a little bottle of whiteout with me. <laughs> and I, I would first look for page 74 and white out the extra zero. Yep. Uh, when the book was uh, reprinted, the zero was dropped. Yeah. Uh, but that's the fear you have when you uh, write a book. Somebody is going to find an embarrassing typo that you missed. Well, you know, along those same lines, I don't know if anybody does this, but you, know, you write a book on a subject and you think you got it everything there and you learn something new. Well, that's what happened in the case of the Korean book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you put notes in the back of that book saying if I ever have to redo it or... Yes, yes, yeah. I do. I do. And some books have gotten very fat with things that have, <laughs> <laughs> that have been inserted. Yeah. If you have a chance, you do uh, rewrite or, or um, add to a book. Uh, one occasion was very interesting this way. Uh, a very successful book of mine was a biography of Whistler, the painter. Uh, I finished the book. It was a front page review in the New York Times book review. It was uh, successful. Uh, it was reprinted. Uh, and then I found new information. And another publisher came along and wanted to reprint the book a second time. I said, I have new information I'd like to add. Uh, I was told, well, with a paperback, it's expensive to, re to redo the book. 
Is there some way we could put, out, put this in otherwise? I said, yes. Uh, there are partially blank pages at the end of each chapter. Uh, we can print using the same typeface uh, the new material if it, is, if it fits at the end of, the, of, of each chapter where it is useful. And we did that. Really? Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, Rodell, did you know what you were buying into when you married this guy, that you would be researching <coughs> so much? Not a, not a clue. <laughs> no comment? Yeah. <laughs> not a clue. Oh. Uh, besides, when he started writing, I had to teach him English. He wrote the German construction. Ah. She meant that I put verbs at the end of sentences. And, and the sentences were very long. Mm -hmm. But he's learned. <laughs> Good people. Well, you've, you've been a terrific team. Uh, as you sit back and, and you're sitting here today and you've written so many books, and I'm sure you're constantly thinking of the next book and making notes of the next book, uh, can you divulge what, what is next? Uh, the next, y yes, Rodell. <coughs> what? There are two. There are two. One of them answers one of the questions you asked earlier. Uh, I'm probably the world's leading uh, expert on Bernard Shaw. I've edited or written 20 books uh, on or about Bernard Shaw. I am now I have now collected uh, material I've written about Bernard Shaw before he wrote his first play. Uh, he was 35 when he wrote his first play, or when he published or produced his first play uh, in 1892. I wanted to, to collect this material and revise it and update it and call it Embryo Playwright, Bernard Shaw Before His First Play. The book is now in the process of being published. Uh, I have read proofs of about one-third of it now. And the publisher is changing the title. The publisher is changing the title because he says, uh, people who are going to search online uh, will find that the first word is embryo. And the book is not about embryos, it's about Bernard Shaw. And the title is becoming, I think, uh, Bernard Shaw before his first play. Next line, Embryo Playwright, being reversed. But the other book I'm working on, the, that one is finished. The other book I'm working on is a memoir. It's called a Writing Life. And probably a lot of what I've just told you will either be in a writing life or I should put it in. <laughs> And if Rodell has a good memory, she will remember what I've said that will have to go in the book that isn't in yet. And that will be two volumes. And then there's one more that you're thinking about, <clears throat> World War II. I'm not sure I'm going to write another book about World War II. Uh, but I'm thinking of one uh, called Nader, N-A-D-I-R. The low point of World War II was 1942. Uh, when everything went bad until toward the end of the year uh, when we landed in North Africa, uh, when the Germans were stopped at Stalingrad, and so on. And that, that would have been November, December 1942. Uh, I'm thinking of a book that will deal with the downside of 1942 and end with a happy ending, with the, the turnaround. I may write it. I'm collecting information for it. Uh, I may find that I'm too old and tired to write it, and I'll abandon it. I don't know. But you certainly don't appear to be too old or too tired. I feel like I've just had a history course, and <laughs> this should be part of the History Channel. And wow, this has been terrific, Stanley. I can't thank you enough on behalf of the Jackson Center and everybody else for just taking all that time. Is there one question, Phil, that you can't wait to have answered? No, I can't, huh? your question you want to ask Phil? <laughs> <laughs> I think I've talked myself out. Okay, well this has been terrific. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Was there a question we should have asked, Wardell, that we missed? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, how about one humorous time in Korea? One humorous incident that happened to you in Korea? 
Just a, just a Brighton story. A humorous incident that happened in Korea. I'm not sure I can think I of one. Pineapple juice martinis. Oh, yeah, that's a good oh. one. And, and the Tootsie Rolls. Oh, well, well that, the Tootsie Roll episode didn't happen to me, uh, but it happened. Uh, the troops in North Korea, who were surrounded by the Chinese and had to escape, uh, radioed Japan for Tootsie Rolls. Uh, Tootsie Roll was code for, uh, f uh, for uh, ammunition, uh, shells for mortars. Uh, the Japanese warehousemen uh, who took the order didn't understand. They sent tons of Tootsie Rolls by air uh, to North Korea. And the troops found only one use for them because at 30 below zero, uh, they didn't melt very easily. Uh, they plugged bullet holes in their radiators uh, with Tootsie Rolls. <clears throat> so they did get used. Uh, what Riddell or Phil was talking about, um, I think, about martinis is that I was introduced to martinis uh, by uh, people uh, I had uh, served with uh, who used pineapple juice and medicinal alcohol uh, to make a so-called martini. Uh, that it was easy to get canned pineapple juice uh, and medicinal alcohol was everywhere. So we had martinis, but a war correspondent visiting at the time uh, shared the martinis with us uh, and then managed to drag me back to my cot. <laughs> <laughs> That was my first martini. <laughs> Welcome to the world. Well, thank you once yeah. again. This has been terrific. Fantastic. Fantastic. Fantastic.